right, so um, I've been a geek, I've been an entrepreneur, I've been a marketer, uh, I've been an angel investor. Uh, more recently, I'm a venture capitalist, which I, I hate to admit, but I think the difference now is that I'm professionally managing other people's money, uh, the fools. Um, and uh, I guess uh, a lot of what we've been doing with 500 Startups, which is our fund, uh, is based on changes that we've been seeing kind of over the last decade in Silicon Valley, but uh, really a lot of things that have kicked in over the last two to five years. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about this uh, going forward. Um, so I'm assuming everybody here has heard of the Lean Startup and Eric Reese and all that sort of world. Um, what we're really trying to do with this is apply a lot of those ideas to the venture capital profession and sort of get iterative and you know be more scientific, hopefully, about the investment process, not just the startup process. Uh, these slides are on SlideShare. I tweeted them out. Uh, so hopefully, if you guys want to follow along or read ahead, you can. Um, all right, so the, the things that I'm going to talk about at a high level uh, are basically there are these very, very large platforms, let's say those are 100 million users or more. Uh, and I'm pretty sure you're all familiar with these, but what's kind of interesting is that there are now five, six, maybe even seven major platforms, most of them global or at least Western uh, economies in the US and the EU, um, where this provides a lot more choice for developers uh, and actually a ton more user acquisition and distribution vehicles than ever before. Uh, why is that interesting? Uh, it provides a lot of alternatives if any one of those platforms decides to fuck around with you and start to introduce tough terms or increase kind of like uh, the cost structure. Um, so when we saw, one of the things that happened maybe about three or four years ago was that Facebook was very loose with the initial distribution uh, options on their platform and then they dialed that down. And whether you think that was a good or a bad decision, uh, that resulted in a lot less virality for certain uh, Facebook application developers. Um, and at the same time, uh, or a little bit thereafter, Apple rolled out the iPhone and iOS platforms. And what we saw was kind of a shift from uh, development activity from Facebook to iPhone right around that time. Not necessarily dramatic, but it was interesting to see that as Facebook sort of toughened the terms on one platform, another platform was available where developer interest moved there. So if you think about that at a more macro level, the more competition going on between these platforms, the larger audiences that you can reach, the better the universe is for entrepreneurs and for developers and arguably for investors and for consumers as well. Um, the other thing that's been happening has been, unfortunately, pretty terrible performance in the venture capital asset class <laughs> over the last uh, 10 years. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, um, typically venture capital is a 10-year illiquid security. So when people start venture capital funds, they're usually structured as the investors put money in, and then they get money back out maybe over that 10-year period, but the most of their investment may not appear for 10 years, and in fact, may even not appear for 12 or 14 years. So it's a very long-term investment. And what does that mean? It means the people who invest in venture capital tend to look at it in 10-year slices. And so what was interesting was that some really major tectonic shifts in venture capital happened around the 2000 and 2001 time frame. And you would think that people would have learned from maybe some of the mistakes that were obvious and apparent at those times and immediately changed their behavior. That did not actually happen, at least in the LP community. There were a lot of the LP, limited partners, the people who invest in venture capital. They actually didn't change a lot of their behavior until almost five to 10 years later. Uh, and so, one of the things that was happening was that even though venture capital had shitty performance, there's these huge like craters of companies that just had like terrible things happen in 2000, 2001, LPs kept putting money into the asset class. And, and you might argue that some of that was because of turmoil in real estate and other areas, but it was sort of crazy when you look at the overall world of startups being that, hey, a lot of things like cratered and did very poorly, and also startups in general needed less money, and the response to that was VCs generally got bigger and LPs put more money into their funds kind of an irrational set of behavior. Um, but until you look at asset class performance over a 10 year period, you wouldn't have seen that because the early, mid late 90s performance was fantastic, largely due to insane retail market investors uh, and other things going on. So these, these LPs really are on 10 year time horizons. They know this like huge like negative event occurred, but the overall performance looks kind of good until you actually move out of the late 90s range 
And then what happens right around 2000, 2001, if you start measuring 10 years from 2000, 2001, wow, that asset class looks terrible, right? And so what's been happening in the last two or three years, particularly after the 2008 you know, financial crash is a lot of these investors in venture capital woke up, realized, holy shit, this is a stupid asset class for us to be in. It performs terribly. It's illiquid. We have much less liquidity in the last couple of years as a result of that, and we should probably pull back our overall al all asset allocation to this category in general. That has resulted in a lot less uh, venture capital funds being formed in the last couple of years, with, with the exception of a few very uh, notable billion dollar funds being raised by some of the best, or at least most recently best performing VCs. But most of the rest of the folks in the venture capital industry have had a lot of challenges raising money in the last couple of years since the 2008 shift and since LP started looking at the asset class. So I know this is kind of like maybe academic and esoteric, but it has a lot of impact on how investors think about investing in you. And I think it's, it's useful to understand the background that's going on here. Another thing that's sort of been happening is uh, a lot of these smaller funds have come out, so ones like ours that are maybe in the 20 to 100 million dollar range, and a lot more super angel or angel activity going on. Uh, that's also as a result of capital efficiencies in many software companies being built. So starting about 10 years ago, a lot less uh, uh, money required to get companies off the ground. So I'm not paying for servers in general, I'm not paying for enterprise software licensing, I'm not paying very much for bandwidth, it's all in the cloud. Most of our cost structure has gone to headcount, and because of all the efficiencies in the underlying infrastructure and plumbing on the web, I can now do a lot of things with a small team of one to three people that used to take 10, 20 people and a lot of capital. So instead of having $5 million sort of initial rounds of financing required to get companies off the ground and build product, I can now start with maybe only half a million dollars or even in some cases, $50,000. Okay, last piece, and I'm sort of stealing thunder here, is as a result of the reduction in capital required to get these things off the ground, uh, we can now do a lot more experiments on a much more quick basis. So it may be that the recent trend in lots of small investments is a passing fad. It may be that you know, some blow up event happens in another year or two out, but I don't think so. I think this is actually a structural change that's happened in the overall industry as a result of two things. One is dramatic reductions in costs that started happening about 10 years ago. Those are not going backwards. We're not gonna go back to paying millions of dollars for servers or software or not be, be purchasing things in the cloud. And the other thing is I've had the emergence of all these huge distribution platforms from multiple providers, Google, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube within Google, App, Android within Google, Apple. I have many, many platforms for choice, much larger access to customers, and that also means that I can do lots of small experiments and succeed much better than ever before. So increased capital efficiency, uh, much greater access to customers, dramatic upheavals in venture capital, which are penalizing most, or most large funds, although a few have done well, and a lot more increase in sort of like small startups and small investors overall. Okay, that's what I'm gonna generally talk about. Do people have questions or comments before I move on? Intelligent questions or comments? No, come on, you guys not, you, you're not challenging any of this. This is all perfect, I know all this, Dave. I don't give a fuck about what you're saying. <laughs> I want an interactive audience. What's wrong about anything that I've just said? What do you question? Silence. Somebody ask one intelligent question. Give me one criticism of what I've said. Why are you missing PayPal as a platform? Why am I missing PayPal as a platform? Yeah, okay, maybe. <laughs> Amazon too. Where's Microsoft? Ah, you you really don't want. So so Bindi's missing. Uh, Bindi is failing to to reference the two-hour argument I had last night between the hours of 1:30 in the morning and 3:30 in the morning with a senior PR spokesperson from Microsoft. Uh, yes. Right. Does the investment uh, return? Right. I actually think it works better, but that's a great question, and I don't know that we can answer it during the course of this lecture, but I'll give you some food for thought on that. If you have questions, please wait for a microphone. Thank you. Yeah. Um, what I think it actually does is it maybe reduces the chance of losing money. Uh, it may also reduce the chance of making a lot of money. 
Uh, if you don't listen to anything else that I say and you don't find any of this useful, I think you might find these books useful. So uh, my favorite, favorite, favorite book right now to pimp is this book called Spent by Jeffrey Miller, uh, Sex, Evolution, and the Secrets of Consumerism. What a tantalizing title. It's all about uh, applying evolutionary biology and consumer marketing and sex, which we're all not interested in at all. Uh, if you want the theoretical reference for that, The Mating Mind is the precursor to this book. A uh, fascinating series of kind of observations that Jeffrey Miller made about Charles Darwin's research, uh, not on natural selection, which is widely accepted by everyone, but actually Charles Darwin's theory of sexual selection, which took the last 20 years of his life and was trying to explain everything that wasn't explained by natural selection. All right, uh, I'll Day, move on. Day, yes. Can I have Thomas. a question on the first slide, right? I mean, yeah. did, do, do you think that the uh, appearance of like uh, more smaller investors and, and their kind of more activity from them also comes from the uh, availability of information? I mean, it's now, now it's way easier to, to uh, get access to investors and for startups and, and the other way, you know, it's like Twitter, AngelList, I mean, you name it. It's, yep. it's I mean, you don't have to be big. Um, so I personally agree. I don't know if we have enough data to really prove that, um, but uh, AngelList has certainly been also a major shift at least for some of us in the valley yeah. and uh, the ability for us to find out about deals at the very least yeah. uh, from social media and other services i don't know that we are any more significantly informed about the performance of those companies yeah. um, but that's maybe possible in the future so anyone else yeah yeah um after eliminating the middle tier of the smaller funds yes isn't there a risk that the larger funds set up internally micro VCs, so uh, setting yes, up seed fact, funds, the big ones, and eliminating the, the lower part? I don't think it eliminates the lower part, but I think you're correct that many large funds also have their own strategy. So Sequoia is an investor in Y Combinator. I manage a small internal portfolio for Founders Fund. Um, you know, not to mention my investors, but some of them are VC funds as well. Uh, and I think there's other programs that VCs run which are equivalent to seed investment. Um, but th all that aside, I think you're going to see a lot more uh, incubator and small fund experimentation over the next year. Uh, and even if many of them screw up, you'll see continually more variation in the theme on this stuff. So, yeah. Um, yeah I, I don't know if you're going to address this later, but, you know, I think one of the uh, sort of the pros and the cons of the... Uh, of the, the ecosystem shifts that you're talking about here. And I think, you know, Bryce uh, at, right. at O'Reilly has written about this in, in the last week or so. Is the social proof issue. Well, there's social proof. There's, you know, he took himself off, off angel list. But the question I wanted to ask you, you know, which is sort of pinned to your shirt, is like, you know, the, <laughs> the notion of if you're an entrepreneur, yes. um, you know, should you, how do you sort of deal with the bandwidth issue uh, right. of your investors. Um, you know, Bryce, <laughs> Bryce sort of wrote about the fact that, you know, there are a lot of deals get done nowadays where it's like they're 5, 10, 15. The party round issue. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, right. what's your advice as an, as, as an entrepreneur about how you should think about, you know, choosing your investors and the number of investors right. and what you should be looking for in from an investor given this so ecosystem? I would say, uh, very quickly just to address that, uh, I would say fractal construction of your investor base, which is to say asymmetric distribution of your round is probably useful. So if you're raising a million dollars, what you might think about is, okay, I'm gonna have one investor at 500,000 to 750,000, I'm gonna have a few investors at 50 to 100,000, I might have a bunch of small angels at 10 to 25,000, uh, and the benefit of that structure is there is one large accountable investor who hopefully is your partner, uh, and that's a beneficial thing that someone has responsibility, probably a board seat at some point as well, um, but that you also make room for other small investors whose value may be significant even if their check size is not. And in fact, I would argue the more you can find valuable people who invest at small check sizes, the better except you shouldn't exclude the fact that there is still one person's butt on the line on the investment. So uh, particularly in our case as a small fund that's doing a lot of small and checks, we are not big fans of board seats. We don't really think they add a tremendous amount of value, but for you as an investor, you may still want the time commitment that comes with someone who's taking a board seat. Uh, and so having that partnership also works. 
All right. Uh, yeah, whatever. Uh, did a bunch of startups. Started out as an engineer. Uh, gradually made my way to uh, lower levels of uh, incompetency. Uh, now as a venture capitalist, I might actually be able to make a living. Um, uh, uh, just short thumbnail on 500 startups. Uh, I won't get into how much money we have at the moment, but let's just say we've done 175 uh, companies so far at an average investment of around $50,000 or so. Uh, we're a little bit unusual in that for a seed fund, we are actually a global uh, vehicle. So 60% of our investments are in Silicon Valley, 30% uh, of the rest of the US, but we've done almost 20 investments across five continents. Uh, so we do actually get around. Uh, the other part that's a little bit unique about our structure is we do both seed investments and we run an incubator. Uh, as part of those seed investments, sometimes we invest in other incubator companies. So we've done over 20 YC companies, over 10 Techstars companies, several uh, seed camp companies, and even uh, one in Beijing with Innovation Works. Uh, and then lastly, we feel really strongly about recruiting the mentor program. Uh, I think seed camp also does this, but we have about 165 people primarily in engineering, design, and marketing areas. Uh, so on the platform side, um, so in my view right now is these are the major things going on. I'm, I'm a little bit sketchy on whether LinkedIn is quite a platform just yet. Uh, and maybe I'm missing, uh, like someone said, a few other large players in there. Um, <laughs> well, I'd, I'd love for Microsoft to be an accessible platform, at least on the consumer side, perhaps on the small business and and larger side, I think it might be construed that, and Xbox probably is a platform. Um, but let's just, I'll jump back to this in a second. When I talk about platform, what I think about is features, users, money. Which of those three do you think is most important from a developer entrepreneur standpoint? Money. Okay, who thinks, uh, who thinks money? Who thinks users? Who thinks features? Okay, so the, the audience's opinion was that users matter most. I would agree with you. Uh, interesting that our venture capitalist in the front was immediately yelling money. <laughs> uh, I actually think big VC would tend to say users matter more first and then money matters. Uh, because if you have great monetization on a small user base, that's not a venture capital story. If you have lots of users without any monetization, that might still be a venture capital story uh, if you can figure that out. Uh, so distribution and audience, probably the first order issue uh, if you're trying to build a big business. At some point, monetization is going to come into play. Features really only matter from a differentiation and competitive standpoint. So when I'm talking about platforms, what I'm primarily talking about is uh, distribution, access to users, and then secondarily, monetization. Uh, within that world, like search has pretty much, at least in the Western economies, become mostly Google's game. Uh, although I will say that Bing has done some interesting things. Uh, when you're 80% of the market, it's tough to really uh, think about the rest of the 10 to 20%, uh, but we'll see. Uh, Facebook and Twitter certainly are interesting universes. You might say Zynga or LinkedIn if you're in those worlds. Uh, Apple and Android. YouTube is an often overlooked platform. In my opinion, a huge opportunity that is growing, still growing in influence, uh, and often not looked at as a development platform. Uh, and then depending on whether you look at Google Plus or Gmail or other things within the Google Office Document Empire, I think those are it as well. Yes? What about local? What about local? Uh, probably Foursquare, a platform in the near future. I would say Foursquare, eight to 10 million users right now. 10 plus, yeah. Yeah, and so maybe, maybe Yelp is another world of that, and Groupon, and Living Social, and maybe a few others. So I would say in a year or two, certainly would be that audience. And if you consider Groupon and Living Social platforms, then the answer is yes now. Um, but I'm, I'm kind of saying 100 million user reach or better is a platform of interest. Yes. Can you give some examples of uh, startups who used YouTube as a platform for growth? I'm not sure. Anybody want to help me with that? I'm trying to think like, what do you say? Justin, Justin Bieber. Actually, good point. Excellent. <laughs> right. Lady Gaga. Probably. But certainly Justin Bieber. How many of you seen the Justin Bieber movie? <laughs> None of you? Seriously, like fucking leave this room right now. Don't listen to my talk and go watch that movie. One of the most inspirational movies for you as an entrepreneur. It will bring you to tears. It will like make you laugh. Like he is an amazing entrepreneur. Absolutely an amazing entrepreneur. Watch that movie. Forget the books that I mentioned. Go watch that fucking movie. It's awesome. It's inspirational. I am not kidding. Watch that goddamn movie. 
he is all of a sudden becoming an investor. Actually, that's another interesting trend. Where's all Mike sorts Erickson? of. Yeah. I don't know that Michael Erickson becoming an investor is a trend, but like no, Steve Nash. Levine, I, uh, oh, did you know I, hear that rumor? I did not hear that rumor. <laughs> Uh, lots of celebrities all of a sudden in investment. Uh, Dave? Yes. Uh, here, just yes. another, uh, what's about infrastructure, like um, phone in the morning, or uh, monetizing the landing pages, or uh, even Google DNS, where they hack into the infrastructure system. Right, I, and I guess, you know, I, I'm not saying that those things are important, and Amazon, you know, is a hugely, like, not on this slide, but I'm just saying, like, that's an infrastructure service. It's not necessarily going to get you access to a bunch of users. There are a lot of people on Amazon, but I would not say you don't have the turn on the faucet experience with Amazon where I can buy users or I can do organic things on, on Amazon to acquire users, at least yet. Maybe with the Kindle, if you're you know, a digital goods provider, that might be an opportunity in the near future. But with, with most of these, what I'm trying to highlight here is either through organic or paid means, I can get access to customers. So organic, I do it without cost because I'm smart. I know viral techniques. I know SEO. I know something else about distribution on you know, mobile platforms, or paid, meaning I know a way where I pay money on a linear basis, I'm going to get more customers. Why is that important? It means I know I have a scalable strategy. So again, as an investor, I want to be able to figure out how, once we solve the product issue, and once we find a demographic, how do we like ramp up growth? And on these, there are interesting techniques that you can use to ramp up growth. They're actually transferable between lots of different business models. Right? So if I get good at SEO and SEM, I can do lots of different search plays. If I get good at viral techniques or Facebook advertising or whatever it is that Twitter has as a distribution strategy, all of a sudden those audiences open up to me as well. Um, and so then if we think about sort of what the game plan is for like how to do entrepreneurship in you know, the 2.0 world, I would argue that we tend to overcomplicate things. Uh, I would also argue that we get too damn geeky uh, about the latest cool newsreader or some awesome like social media aggregation strategy or some other bullshit. Whenever you hear me like talking your business model, probably in the first 30 to 60 seconds, if I haven't figured out how you're going to make money, I will say, how does that make money? And I've had this conversation with a couple people right here tonight. If the answer is you don't know, do not dissemble. Do not say, well, we're going to figure that out. Like, what I, what, actually, I want you to say, we have to figure that out. I don't know if that's the answer. I would like you to say, if you know what the monetization strategy, it's X within the first 15 seconds. Or if you don't know, state that I don't know, and we're going to have to figure that out. Because I've seen way, way, way too many business plans where like, the monetization is super unclear, and you're trying to figure out all sorts of other geeky shit. And the biggest risk in your business right now, for me as an investor, is you have no idea how to make money. And if you don't know how to make money, then the only other way that you're going to get a meaningful exit is you get to 100 million users or more, or some really large number. Right, which is also a significant risk. So there's already plenty of risk in you even being able to produce a product and being able to find your market. So I don't want to have the additional risk of trying to figure out the business model. That's me. There are other investors who feel differently about that. So what does that mean? Well, I can take any kind of problem or solution space and say, let me move that into the 2.0 world. Right? New platforms, new devices, new audiences, whatever. I have some interesting things that I can do to tweak and compete with previous folks, which is I know a couple things that they don't know. Maybe it's because I understand email distribution, SMS, I understand e-commerce or payments, or something's gotten better. But in general, you're solving a problem using software and capital efficient businesses, and your job is to find customers and make money. And this part should be fucking easy. So much easier in the last five to 10 years. This, this, I just busted my flip-flop. <laughs> um, <laughs> this has gotten like massively better, right? How many people are online now compared to 10 years ago? 10 times as many people. How many of them in China and India now have a lot more money than 10 years ago? A lot of them. There's 100 million people in China with average GDP same as US or Europe, right? Like So there's a lot more customers. There's a lot more money. If you figure out the distribution stuff, your world just got tons easier. If you know how to do localization, your life just got tons easier. So don't waste your time on geeky little shit. There are tens, hundreds, thousands of businesses out there where they're easy pickings as long as the revenue model is simple. So don't overcomplicate your business by adding the additional complexity of having something that people really don't want to pay for. 
There are a few businesses like Facebook, like Twitter, and others who had no fucking clue about how to make money initially and then eventually figured it out. You are not likely to be that person. <laughs> I'm not trying to rain on the future parades of the Michael Jordans in the audience, but those of you who are Michael Jordan are going to ignore what I fucking say and go do it anyway. But for many of us who aren't Michael Jordan but are still smart, the world gets a lot easier if your average customer is worth $50 a year instead of zero or five cents. Again, my personal bias. But in a world where distribution and monetization is much easier, like a very small number of customers can get you to a big business. Right? A million customers at $9 a month is a $100 million a year business. OK. Uh, some things on venture capital. So, like we had all these changes. It used to be that like this was the world of venture capital. Uh, maybe 10 years ago it was a little bit smaller, but now we have big funds, which I'm going to say is greater than 250 million. We have medium-sized funds, 50 to 250 million. We have these seed funds, 10 to 50 million. We'd probably put ourselves in that category, and we have incubators and angels, maybe you know much smaller vehicles. Uh, and check sizes maybe range zero to 100,000, maybe 50 to 250,000, 250,000 to 2 million, and then one to unlimited number down here. We're generally not in competition with each other. Actually, the more kind of evolution that's happening, the more like ecosystem, you know, people move up and down the stack or reinvent things. But actually, most of the time, they're really working together. And when you see Sequoia investing in Y Combinator, that's really an evidence that actually they are working together, not competing that much. But here's the thing. Like, in a lot of cases, venture capital is still relevant, primarily because you have large capital expenditures in several areas. Hardware, enterprise, clean tech, bioscience, and then several large internet companies where initial business models may not have been obvious or because they're trying to like, go after huge market segments. So really capex intensive stuff on the left-hand side. But there's also things that don't really require that much venture capital, or none at all, or maybe just a little bit of angel investment. Uh, Porn and gambling are generally revenue-producing company <laughs> businesses that don't actually require a lot of money all the time. Uh, consulting and small business may not scale, but also you can kind of get the money out of those pretty quickly. In general, what I'm saying is that consumer internet business is not very capital intensive, at least in the first few years. So product development, initial market discovery, not capital intensive parts of consumer internet, particularly where the customer value is higher. Yes? Um, what about SaaS? businesses or sort of B to SME? Because, you know, I, I think uh, at least, you know, what I've seen at, at Seed Camp over the last three or four years, what I've seen, you know, in your investments, in Jeff's investments, yep. Index Seed, etc. I mean, there are a lot of sort of enterprise software businesses that... In general, I think those do require more capital. Um, some because of the sales process, some because of the product development process. You know, Twilio is an example. You know, a lot of hardcore tech there that was taking time to build that up. Also, a lot of expensive salespeople reaching into the enterprise. So there are some pretty significant initial capex and intensive efforts to get those companies off the ground. And and also maybe because the pie is bigger too, you're willing to sort of spend that money. Yeah, I, I guess what I'm saying is that you know you got 37 Signals and others who have very successfully not just bootstrapped, but right. you know, I think to scale. A SaaS business, you're probably going to need small VC or VC, but you know, it may I think we focus a lot on sort of consumer apps. But there's uh, well actually I mean a lot the, the of enterprise innovation that's going on at fairly low cost. So, so the world that I think about is consumer and small business, mainly because of distribution platforms. I don't want to deal with the risk associated with biz dev and enterprise sales, uh, just because I can't control for hiring great salespeople. Other people. <coughs> Maybe able to maybe able to do that, and and we still do some of that, uh, particularly where we can use consumer techniques into the enterprise through the developers or through departmental channels. Um, and I think I just forgot my point. Um, uh, but I think the issue is not so much the structure of the business, but value of the customer and cost to acquire the customer, right? And so where the value generated for the customer in a year is X, and the cost to acquire that customer is X or less than X, at least within 12 months, I would argue those are probably reasonable businesses for you to not have to spend a lot of money, um, particularly if like, your cost to acquire the customer is 20% of X, and you can get to break even within three to six months. And in fact, in the future, I think you'll see a different 
uh, financing product that will start to look like a subscription commerce debt vehicle that allow you to do customer acquisition financing. Right? The, the point that Saul's making here is like how, you know, if you're really trying to spend, you know, go after large swaths of the market, does it require a lot of capital? In general, the answer is yes, but the caveat to that is I'm going to say if I can make back most of the cost of that investment quickly, I think it's less capital intensive than if it takes a year, two years, three years. So one thing that I Dave, don't think a Dave, lot of entrepreneurs spend. Dave, yes. Another comment on this. I mean, one thing is at some point, uh, companies that grow really big will need money of some sort. I think the timing of that inflection point on your cash structure. Yeah. I mean, it used to be that you needed really a, a, at the beginning of the journey. Now it's moving more in the middle. Perhaps in SaaS companies, it still takes a lot of money to, to construct your not network operation center and so get I'm, I'm going to disagree, and I might be wrong about this, but I will say that a lot of people suggesting that come from the big VC world, and I, I really do think it's like the cost of customer acquisition and the value generated is more the issue. Now, people may choose to spend a lot of money, such as Groupon, because they're trying to clear the market. It's not a necessity. I would say that it's a choice. If you're a very profitable company, particularly in the customer acquisition cost, you don't have to finance that with equity. You could finance it with debt. Amazon did that back in the late 2000s, arranged a huge amount of debt, grew mostly on debt, not on equity financing in the second half of their career. Uh, the comment was specific to um, um, the SaaS market where you may have profits, but the cash flows are to the best uh, say over three years rather than your licenses that were being okay like so again I don't want to argue with you but I will say it's not based on whether it's SaaS it's based on how quickly the money comes in because if I can charge like immediately thirty dollars a month and my cost structure is zero then I don't need financing if it takes them 60 days or 90 or 120 days to pay me and it costs a lot more to acquire the customer because of biz dev or sales cycle then I would agree with you and and generally yeah there's gonna be an expensive cost to acquiring enterprise customers but there's a wide variety of SaaS businesses. Um, I don't know whether the answer is yes or no in all cases. Um, anyway, not necessarily the point that I want to make, and I'm, I may be wrong about this. Yes. Yeah, how do you feel about then the, the financial uh, startups? Uh, I, I know that there are a lot of changes there that makes it cheaper. Can I defer but this question? there's still a lot of regulatory I, I, stuff. I want to get to a point that I think we would all agree on and not that we disagree on. I think that most startups are not doing the math on customer acquisition and revenue generated. A lot of your financing structure, a lot of your marketing strategy should be based on what does it cost to acquire the, com the customer and how many of them and where and what revenue is generated as a result of that and how long does it take to come in. Right? So again, the math is different. If it costs me $50 to acquire the customer and I make $50 back in the first month, that's a great world. If it takes me 12 months to get $50 back, that's a very different world. If it takes 48 months to get that customer back, that's a very different world. So understanding the timing of cost structure to acquire the, company, to acquire the customer and when it's generated back dictates much of your financing structure. It may also dictate your marketing strategy, whether if your customers, like Mint as an example, we thought the customer was worth a lot of money, probably north of $25 to $50. That's different than you know, Facebook where they're worth $1 to $2. Right? If they're worth $50, I can spend $20. I don't need viral techniques to go after those customers. If they're only worth $1 to $5, I may not be able to do anything except organic and viral techniques to acquire those customers. Does that make sense? Do you guys get why I'm like, prioritizing? So one of the things I will ask you when I first you know, want you to understand your business is, do you understand unit economics for your customer? Anybody know what that means and want to explain that? Not solved. Entrepreneur, unit economics, what does that mean? How do you tell people what it's about? Come on, jump in. I will take you out for beers tonight if you answer this question successfully. Might even write you a check. I think you just explained it, but surely it's just how much it costs to acquire a customer right. and what is annual lifetime value, I mean, right. annual value is. Uh, could so be initial value for a transaction, could be value over a year, could be value over the lifetime of the customer if that's more than a yeah. year. And I would encourage you to think about those three scenarios. So what's a transaction worth? What's one year of customer value worth? What's the lifetime of the customer if it's more or less than 12 months? Yeah. Great, go ahead, keep going. So yeah, it's a question of unit economics. Keep it simple. How right. much does it cost? How much will you draw in in revenue terms? How much does it cost to acquire the customer? Is yeah. there a single answer there or is there multiple answers? Do all customers answers. cost the same to acquire? 
No, of course they don't, depending on Why? the business, the sector. Right, where do they come from? Yeah. What's the, the demographic? Channel, might have two or three different types of customers. A million different factors. Right, so again, an issue for you to think about is I might have a wide variety of customers to uh, acquire with different demographics, different cost structures, different revenue generated. You may want to go after many of those. You may want to concentrate on one or more of those sectors. Right, so your understanding of customer economics and revenue generated should be a primary issue for you to put down in your business model or in your pitch. I think it's very helpful if you understand those numbers before you get started on building the business. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. sorry, just one last thing. Obviously, you talked about on a per unit basis, but obviously then it is dictated by, or your revenue is dictated by how many customers you actually have. So in a B2B, it might be less. In a B2C, you're hoping it's millions. Right, in a, in a B2B business, you might need to get some number of business development or salespeople to get those customers. In a consumer business, you might have a scalable process where there's initial upfront infrastructure to get that going, and then after that, you may be able to scale with marginal costs from the, which one? I'm competing with helicopters here. Uh, just, just wanted to say one thing on unit yep. economics. I mean, yes. I think your focus, the, the focus on acquisition, cost, you know, that's sort of the input and the output is revenue. Is right. Quite, there's another dimension I think a lot of people discount, which is cost to serve. Cost to serve. So, you know, for example, if you look at Facebook or Twitter. Right, right, right. So is, it, is it close to zero or is it non-zero? Well, it's your infrastructure cost. Right. So you, you get someone to your front door, that costs you X. You know, the front door, the house, costs you Particularly y. for so physical goods delivery businesses, that's not. But it's also yeah. servers, yeah. ops, data yeah. centers. I mean, I tend to like to think that in most cases, the digital goods cost goes to zero. Uh, that hasn't always been the case, particularly with YouTube in the early years. That was definitely not the case. Or YouTube, or many of the platforms you described, right. the or cost a high to touch, service, like high touch customer enormous. service business also. Zappos. You know, might, uh, might cost you a lot of money. Or if you have a policy of any kind of return I'll accept. That might also increase your operational cost. So unit economics upfront helps me know that you have a basic handle on the financing structure for your business. And then as we explore other things, cost of acquisition and marketing different channels, maybe trying to maximize revenue, we can at least tweak the dials. But you want to have that upfront understanding of revenue, uh, revenue generated, at least potential revenue generated, and then a variety of different customer acquisition costs, probably by channel and by demographic. Uh, all right, so this is like another thing that's going on here. So in the last 10 years, we've had a lot more large internet companies get to ridiculous amounts of cash on hand. Uh, they're doing a lot of innovation outsourcing, i.e. buying innovation rather than developing it internally. Uh, somewhat noticeably, I would say Facebook and Apple and occasionally Google have still been able to do quite a bit of innovation at large scale. Uh, but all of them are still acquirers of innovation. Uh, the other thing I think you're going to see more of is non-tech companies doing acquisitions. Uh, so for example, uh, Walmart, which maybe is a tech company, maybe is a retail company, just did a $300 million acquisition of a specialty search engine company. Uh, Johnson & Johnson did a uh, purchase, I think, a baby center a while back. But I think you're going to see, wh why is this going to happen? Well, all these public companies that are consumer facing, their audiences are moving online. Probably 80% of them are online. Their, their revenue channels are also moving online. So they need technology understanding, web distribution understanding to keep up with the rest of the market, which means, great story for you guys, probably a lot of buyers of your companies are not just the tech platforms, but a bunch of non-tech platforms who may have even more need and motivation to bring that technology in-house. And again, here's another thing that's happening is because of capital efficiency, founders own more of the company. What does that mean? From an investor standpoint, that's a challenge. It means they're probably more likely to sell early. So there's probably gonna be a lot more acquisitions, but probably at smaller numbers. And what venture capitalists typically are now doing in order to ensure that there's alignment is they will do founder liquidity, probably in the Series B, possibly even earlier, uh, but for some small percentage. So in order to keep you aligned, and rather, take, rather than have you take a 20 to $50 million exit into your pocket, they might say, well, let's play for a bigger win, but we'll give you a little bit of founder liquidity in the Series B round. Um, but as an example, again, Mint was acquired by Intuit for $170 million after only three years. Uh, not much dilution. Aaron probably owned, I think, around 20 to 30% of the company. Uh, and so that was a pretty big payday for him. So it's. Uh, yeah, actually, he did because the, la well, 
Nice. Interesting little story, the D round financing for Mint was $30 million by DAG and Founders Fund, uh, 30 days before they eventually got acquired by Intuit, and a week after they walked away from the table from Intuit with an offer. So they actually walked away from the table, offer for Intuit, did a $30 million round, and then 30 days later sold the company for a little bit more money. Interesting play to, way to play poker. Uh, but yeah, they raised a lot of money, but they built the company probably on less than $10 million initially. So, you know, let's say the $10 million in infrastructure kind of to build that business for, sold for $170 million in three years. Pretty great, you know, at least for the founders and for the earlier investors. Um, all right, I know I'm probably going over, and if I'm boring you, we'll cut to the chase and go drinking. Um, so I don't think I need to belabor this. Incubators are a way to take advantage of what's going on due to reduced cost of, uh, of building these companies, but also uh, concentrating experiments in a small space. So a lot of what we're trying to do uh, at 500 Startups, because we have the physical infrastructure, and when I was running the Facebook fund previously, same thing, is get lots of smart people in close physical proximity. What happens in those environments? Couple things, one is, if you're working on similar problems, either similar platforms, similar customer demographics, similar, similar industries, you learn faster because other people pass along that information. The other thing that's interesting that happens is an environment where you have, let's say, 20 teams, probably 20% of those groups are gonna outperform. You're gonna have the top 20% of that class do better, right? So that might be four or five teams that are the top performers. What happens with them? They start competing with each other. Maybe unintentionally, but in our Facebook class when I taught it at Stanford, there were five different teams that had million user uh, download apps, but they leapfrogged throughout the course of the semester. There were five different teams that had the lead depending on what's going on. So they're competing with each other, sometimes copying each other, but also competing and learning from each other. And the other thing that happens is when you have that competitive environment going on with some outperformers, the next group watches what's going on, and they might not have been able to figure it out themselves, but they see other people modeling the behavior, and then they copy, right? So you wanna have enough of a sample size so that smart people concentrated figure out problems and compete with each other, and then maybe not quite as smart, but still some smart people watch and copy that behavior. So that's the advantage of having a larger number of experiments going on in a close proximity environment, is you get that competitive environment and then the copying and modeling behavior going on. Uh, so, success based on many small experiments, quick iteration cycles and rotations, uh, hopefully similarity in maybe platforms or customers, uh, also having the mentor environment so that that's concentrated and bringing them in on a regular basis, uh, and then, you know, basically forcing them to get to some conclusion quickly, right? So, one of the other reasons that a lot of people are maybe doing these small investments is it forces you to figure out stuff on a quicker timeline. That may also shorten or reduce you know, the kind of goals that people go after, but you are sort of seeing a lot more interesting behavior in three to six months. Uh, I'm gonna skip the uh, lean metrics part for these startups. I think you guys have probably seen all this stuff from, uh, from Steve Blank and Eric and myself. This is startup metrics for pirates, et cetera. Um, so here's where I think this gets interesting. Is like my basic philosophy for how you build products is like these one, two, three steps, right? Don't, don't worry too much about the acquisition channel until you've actually gotten activation and retention first. So your job is to be meaningful for a small set of customers, enough that they will find out how to use your product once and then come back more than once to use it again. If you fail in the initial steps of having people figure out how to use your product or have it be meaningful to them the first time they use it, or never come back. If you fail in any of those three things, I would not suggest that you work on anything else except those things. Now I will say I want you to have a basic business model and a way to make money first, but if you can't get customers to use your product and you can't get them to come back, it's pretty much useless to focus on acquisition and referral. You're trying to, you're trying to like fill a leaky bucket, right? So your job at first is to figure out what is meaningful to customers, expose that enough that they can find it, click on it, use it, and then have a meaningful enough experience that they come back and use it again. Step one, do that. If you progress from that step, then let's figure out how to scale up the usage. And if you progress from that step, let's figure out how we really make money at this. Now, you may, if you're not financed, have to do step three before step two. Right? If you don't have financing, you can't necessarily scale up a negative cash flow business right away. If you have venture capitalists, you actually can do that. <laughs> Might not be a good idea, but like, sometimes that actually does happen. 
All right, so let's take this philosophy now and move it to the investment environment. So now, 10 years ago, we'd probably do $5 million investments in the company and figure out whether we were wrong or not. And then maybe starting about six or seven years ago, I would say Josh Koppelman, First Round Capital, was one of the people who pioneered the, let's try that with $500,000, right? Because cost structure had gone down. We'll still take board seats, we'll still act like a VC, but now we're gonna write a lot more smaller checks at the $500,000 level to figure out whether we're wrong or not. And then based on additional innovation, probably mostly starting with Paul Graham and then many others, maybe Ron Conway as well, you had a lot of other people writing these really small checks, you had much more capital efficiency, you had a lot more distribution efficiency, and now you can figure out whether people are idiots on just $50,000, yay! It does not cost me $5 million to figure out whether you're an idiot. It doesn't cost me $500,000 to figure out an idiot. I figured out you were an idiot on $50,000. Great. We're the non-idiots. <laughs> okay, so now, instead of doing one $5 million check or $10, uh, $500,000 checks, I'm gonna do 100 $50,000 checks. 70 of them, 80 of them are still gonna fail but I'm failing on a much smaller budget or I'm learning a lot more. I still got 20 or 30 that figured out that first step. They got through product risk and maybe initial customer usage and now I double down and on those 20 or 30 I'm gonna do the $500,000 bet probably with some other friends of mine and then on those 20 or 30 maybe they get through market adoption figure out some revenue generation steps and now 10 of those made it to the real big venture deals and now we're gonna plop down five, $10 million on those folks. So now I've gotten a much more capital efficient and learning way to go after this. And some people may call this spray and pray, but I would actually call it a quantitative method for discovering whether or not you're an idiot and saving my capital until I discovered that you're not an idiot. And so. Um, how do you decide when something fails? Uh, so I decide when something fails if you run out of money, <laughs> Uh, you continue to demonstrate a lack of learning behavior, uh, which I would describe as you make a lot of changes to your product, but nothing happens in terms of either usage or users. Um, but, but basically what I'm looking for is users, usage, revenue. How does an entrepreneur decide when they failed? Ooh. I don't know if I can answer that one. Um, that's a, that's a very personal decision. And actually, having gone through a business where I almost went bankrupt several times <laughs> uh, and ran payroll on credit card debt and had credit card debt north of $100,000 and a lot of other issues that came up, I mean, the, dis <laughs> the, the thing to decide, yeah, I'm, I'm totally serious about that. I had some, uh, some serious dark days there. Um, you know, it's a very personal decision to figure out when you're going to, like, call it a day. Uh, no, I think when you take a job, you've already called it in a while before that. Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, so I mean, personally speaking, I had to lay off a bunch of people. I decided to take the risk of bankruptcy while still trying to figure out an acquirer. Like, I went through a lot of hard times, and I had a small, soft landing out of that. I've seen other friends have much harder landings out of that. Um, my general framework for this is, have you found customers that care about your product? If you've found customers that care about your product, you're almost never gonna let go of that. If you're sitting there spinning your wheels and trying to pivot and find something, and you still haven't had a customer either bitch you out or tell you that they love you, then you're wasting your time. Now, you may have to figure out whether you're making money or not, but, but the reason I bring this up is the love-hate equation, right? Like, Nothing sucks more than silence or indifference. If you have customers bitch you out over the phone, you know what? That's a great thing. It is a great thing because if they didn't fucking care about you, they wouldn't waste the time. Hate is much closer to love than indifference. Indifference is terrible signal. You cannot iterate around indifference. You can iterate around hate. If people are yelling at you, they are providing information. If they are bitching you out on the phone, writing you an email, telling you why this sucks, why that sucks, you gotta be thinking to yourself, why the fuck are you wasting your time with me if you think this sucks so bad? Probably because there is an underlying problem that they have that they really want solved and you didn't solve it for them, which is why they are bitching at you. Because somewhere in there is the hope that if they bitch at you and you change your behavior, you might actually fix their problem. So hate is great signal. Love is great too usually measured by how much they're gonna pay you, but hate is not bad signal. 
if you keep spinning your wheels and keep developing product and you are not getting customer signal, absolute magnitude of customer signal, if you are not getting anybody to hate you or love you, call it a fucking day. Go find a different customer segment, niche to find a more specific customer segment, try a different solution. You should be in search of customers that love you or hate you. If they don't do either, call it a day. Just worth mentioning survey.io here. Sure. Just as a tool. Uh, so uh, Sean and he, uh, sorry, uh, what's Sean's last name? Sean Ellis. Sean Ellis. <laughs> Uh, and Heaton Shaw developed a product called Survey.io, which was uh, early customer surveys around whether you would love or hate something if we took it away. Uh, and usually that gets to the heart of the problem. And the other way I, I talk about that is kill a feature, which is if you're, if you're trying to find like what works for a customer, basically gradually like, keep stripping away features until your customers scream. And if you strip away everything and they don't scream, great, you have nothing of value for them. If you strip away one thing and then all of a sudden like they don't care, they don't care, ah, and they're like bitching about the thing that you just took away, congratulations, you just found the essence of your product. And then either focus on charging for that or building back up. Like I think, again, one of the mistakes we make as entrepreneurs is trying to build too much and satisfy too many entrepreneurs and not getting to the essence of sort of what is meaningful to at least one decent sized customer segment. If you can find out something that's meaningful to that customer segment, and, and the important part here is relative to competition, right? Not independent of their awareness. But when I solve some problem for you, it's relative to their awareness of other alternatives. And hopefully there's a delta there that you can uh, expand upon. Yes? Uh, you mentioned before that the cost of finding out if someone is an idiot has gone from 5 million pounds to 50K. Yeah. Um, does, that, <laughs> does that basically say that the uh, filter hasn't gotten any better since uh, companies were more expensive to, to launch? Uh, I think this gets to the how do venture capitalists figure out whether you're smart or not before they write you the check. In general, my opinion is we really haven't gotten that much better at that. I think hindsight is an excellent way to figure out whether someone's an idiot or not. After six months, you kind of know either they were an idiot or I was an idiot, but like, you know. So you have no fear of like adverse selection or moral hazard issues because you are taking on 500 people and the money comes a little bit easier. I, just I because think you the you want to you want to try and influence that filter as high as you can, but you're still going to have a high fail rate. Yep. It's the hiring issue, right? Try as much as you can to have a great hiring process. You're still going to know a lot more three months after the hire than three months before the hire. Don't care how hard you work, right? And so part of what we've done as a result of our fund is structure our investment strategy so that the second check is at least as important as the first check and probably more important, right? And third check and so on, right? So I'm assuming I have very limited and lossy information about that first decision, so I limit the amount of capital enough that I can figure out whether I was right or not, but not that much more. Now, that may not be the same math for you as an entrepreneur. You may want to go with the investor who's gonna give you more capital. But in, a, in, a, in an environment where fail rates are high, I would say our strategy does make sense to limit capital deployment until after you've proven some kind of milestone. Hey Dave, yes. Time. Yep, sorry. Do you have a lot more? Or no, this was basically the last thing. So all these last three slides are basically like, how do I think about milestones for staging of investment, right? This is me as the investor. It may not be you, but what I would say is I want to know that you can find some minimum viable product for some number of users. Doesn't have to be a lot, but some non-zero number of users. So you're proving that you can build the product for at least a non-zero number of customers. Ideally, there's some payment in there at well, as well that proves that you're not full of shit on the revenue model. But useful functionality for some non-zero number of customers. If I get to that point, great. Next phase is market validation and revenue testing. So this is can I prove that there's a decent sized market? What does it cost to acquire the customer? And can I start to learn a little bit about revenue generation? So now that you've proven that you can build the product and somebody cares, how many people care? How much do they care? Where do I get those customers? And what do they generate in revenue? Now I've started to formulate a financing structure and model and maybe even a marketing strategy for building a really big business. And then if I feel like we've gotten over that hump, guess what, now we really start piling money in. Right? Now, the strategy may be different if I'm going for profitability than if I'm going to try and get as much of that market as possible. But basically, I don't want to do this big bet until I figured out these two steps, which is product validation and market validation. 
right? And so again, if I can limit my cost structure to get enough uh, information to get past that milestone, great. Then I take the next step, but fail rates are high on both of those first two steps. Uh, a few words on sort of the global versus local strategy since we're talking to an international audience. Um, so uh, I think the one thing that's also happened is because the audience of people has gotten so big, our ability to do niche solutions has gotten much better. So the <coughs> point I was trying to make here is that the web gets bigger, world gets smaller, your solutions can get smaller too. Dave, yes. just a quick question on the, on the last point. Do you have any um, uh, sort of rule of thumb or heuristics on, on the valuation between those, those different levels? Um, obviously it's going to depend on the company, but you know, is it 1 to 3x, 3x to 10x? Um, you know, once you've hit those milestones, is it... You mean valuations for of the, the company, company, whatever the company is. I, I don't know that, I mean, I still think it's more based on the customer value of the business than the stage of the business itself. So very different valuation structure if I'm selling cars than if I'm selling sticks of chewing gum. Definitely, but I'm just sort of thinking, basically what you said there is you're taking risk out at each stage. So yeah. right. if, if, you're, if you're doing it perfectly, the, the, the ultimate sort of risk adjusted return should be at the same as e at e each level of investment. I, I, I wouldn't say I have a, a very well formed thesis on this. I would say right now what I've seen is we've gotten about a third of investments from one stage to the next at incubation and seed, maybe a little bit higher than that, but about a third. And in the long run, I would say five to 15% of businesses uh, probably are generating value that's meaningful for the fund. Uh, those are very low numbers and I'm kind of like, I don't have enough data yet. Yeah, but the data from one to two, is there a wide distribution of valuation multiples between yeah. stage one I and mean, two? I mean, I think or? it's a lot more based on market demand. Like yeah. a lot of times uh, valuations are going up because there's more people investing at seed, not necessarily because the businesses have some endemic value or change in what's going on in the market. Like I think we're in a high valuation market right now. I'm very cautious of that. Have mm -hmm. you walked away from any follow-ons uh, because of the value? You know, you thought it was right, but the valuation just yes. got ahead of so it. Yes. So actually, one thing that occasionally happens is I think the team's got a good idea, uh, but a large VC piles in, and now we're not playing for fifty million dollar exits anymore. We're playing for five hundred million dollar exits, and that may not fit our investment thesis unless we also agree that it's a big opportunity. Um, Again, I, I don't have as much experience as a VC, so I'll probably learn a lot more about that over time. I know I'm getting the heave-ho here in a second. So just last point about this international stuff. So um, I will leave you with a few things. There are global languages emerging. There's about four or five of them. Uh, Mandarin and English are both billion speaker languages, and certainly English is going to increase in size. Mandarin probably as well. Uh, Spanish, possibly Hindi, although it's a more fragmented kind of story there. Uh, definitely Arabic, particularly for the European market. I think people should be thinking about Arabic speaking population as GDP rises, as online penetration rises. That's a 500 million user market, possibly a billion user market in 20 years. Uh, the other thing that's happening is with um, iOS apps and other mobile apps, the younger market's also opening up. And when I say younger, I mean like three to seven. My kids are four and six. Why is that an interesting market? Because moms will pay anything for their kids to learn. Very monetizable market. Like, can't think of anything that matters more to parents than paying for their kids' education. And it's a big market. Last time I heard, all of us were kids at one time or another. Uh, so if you, if you think about doing interesting businesses, I would say language-focused education markets, really interesting space. Uh, other one that's going on, uh, this is particularly true in China, but also in other geographies, is top 10% of China population, very wealthy, travels a lot, buys stuff, sends their kids to college in other countries, sends their kids to high school, and even boarding school in other countries. This is kind of mind-boggling, found this one out. Probably there's going to be like 10 million Chinese kids abroad going to boarding school in other countries. Like, mind-boggling amount of money being spent, and I think you'll start to see that in other large you know, demographics as well, probably Indian demographics over the time uh, too. Uh, we have increased global payment, reduced costs, the same thing we were talking about, but now on, just on global scale. Um, but here's the thing, I think people get too entranced with, oh, my market's not big enough, right? What it really should be telling you is the world's exploding and now smaller markets are big enough, right? Because the population of online users in those markets has increased. 
So where internet penetration only used to be 30%, now it's like 80%, right? So even small markets of 20 million people are three times as big as they used to be. If younger users are also part of that population, now it's doubled in size. So our ability to go big really kind of means going niche and going small. And the other thing that's great about that is if I'm developing for niche audiences, my products will be better. If you're a big VC and you're financing a company and you're going after all women ages 20 to 40, and I'm going after women aged 25 to 35 with two kids in northeastern urban environments who drive a car, like I can produce much better products. I'm not even worrying about competition with you. My products will be better. So if you can go for the more niche strategies, you will probably develop better products. And because we have larger populations, we can do that more easily. Uh, last thing I'll say is you do not need to be in Silicon Valley. Don't need to be in Silicon Valley. You might need to be in Beijing. You might need to be in Bangalore. You might need to be in, I don't know, uh, Egypt in about two years after things calm down. Um, might need to be in Southeast Asia. Like there are lots of interesting geographies to go to, and if you believe that, go to those geographies, learn the language, learn the culture, get yourself immersed. Silicon Valley is a good place to be if you want to do deals with a lot of other software companies and platform companies, but you don't have to be in Silicon Valley to sell in English. Hi, Dave. Uh, again. Um, yes, thank you. Um, <laughs> so, do you think that's uh, reflecting in like Silicon Valley VCs and investment as well that they're looking more beyond their own borders and investing in maybe European, Israel? Sorry, yeah, it's, so it's definitely that, but I mean, like, th there are certainly advantages to being in Silicon Valley, mainly because everybody has decided that's the place to go, and so the best people go to Silicon Valley, and if you want to compete better, you end up competing with a lot of people in Silicon Valley. So that's kind of the reason to be there. But we also learn a lot of that information remotely in other places, and we can concentrate capital, and we can create incubation environments in other places. It's the pace that needs to be in your world. Right? If you can't find that pace here, then yeah, go someplace else. But I would actually say right now, Beijing's probably more competitive than Silicon Valley. You really want to be on cutting edge, go to fucking Beijing or Bangalore. There's a lot of things going on there, even if those markets are smaller in, at the moment. Uh, so really, that's it. Um, I would say focus on distribution and monetization, less on the technology. Understand your unit economics up front if you can. Incubators and metrics, I do think it's useful to be in uh, high visibility environments with other people, at least when you're in the experimentation phase. Once you get to like understanding your business, you may want to go someplace else and not be bothered with those people. But being in a place where other people are visibly working on those problems will make you move faster. And lastly, this whole thing about venture capital, it's useful to you to understand what's going on in the investor mentality. Helpful to understand, like, what are you aligning yourselves with? Are you aligning yourself with large investors who want to, like, create billion dollar markets? You want to align yourself with small investors who are playing for reasonable wins? And there are no right answers to those scenarios. But you should understand what the economics are of your investor before you get into bed with them. Uh, that's it for me. I hope I didn't take too much of your time. Let's uh, go drinking. <laughs> Have some dinner.